produced Friday, December 7. Our panelists are Gail Dudak, Lewis Holland, and Carter Randall. Tonight's special guest is Christina Sykes, chairman and CEO, Mackay Shields Financial Corporation. Good evening, I'm Lewis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Those of you who stay up late may have seen the two fellows on Saturday Night Live, caricatures of TV's muscle-bound bodybuilders whose catchphrase is, we want to pump you up. Well, this was the week when that philosophy took over the world economy. Oil was clearly pumping worldwide, and to the obvious frustration of Saddam Hussein, who announced a total hostage release in an effort to regain some leverage for his dwindling position. Despite the absence of oil from Iraq or Kuwait, supplies were plainly abundant. Indeed, Energy Secretary James Watkins was moved to declare, following a visit to the Persian Gulf, that there was now no reason for oil prices to jump, even if war should break out. Since, he said, Iraq posed no realistic threat to crude supplies, and in his words, from an energy perspective, I believe we are through the worst of the crisis. And the world markets seem to agree. The price of a benchmark barrel of oil, which topped $40 in the orgy of financial pessimism less than two months ago, is tonight down to around 26.50. And those who were making hysterical predictions of new inflation are notably subdued. But oil isn't the only thing that is pumping in profusion. There is, at last, the Federal Reserve. And what it's pumping is not black and gooey, but green and crisp, the stuff known as money. Having finally decided that tight money and a credit crunch were not necessarily the best medicine, for a country slipping into recession, a prognosis that became even plainer this week, the Fed was pumping in earnest. It reduced bank reserve requirements for the first time since 1983. It moved significantly into the open market in a series of moves that injected more reserves and made money more available. And it forced the closely watched rate on federal funds, the rate banks charge each other for overnight loans, way down to just above 7%. It may be late in the final reel of this particular drama, but the cavalry is definitely coming. And just in the nick of time, consumers are despondent, scaling back their borrowings, buying fewer homes, and scaring the retailers with a notably sluggish start to Christmas shopping. Manufacturers are equally frightened, laying off workers even in still prospering sectors, and pushing the unemployment rate to its highest level in three years. And the long-suffering auto market is crawling at its slowest pace since the 1982 recession. Will the pumping of oil and the pumping of money get the economy itself pumping up again sometime in 1991? Or will the gloomsters finally be right? Stay tuned, for tonight I'll be talking with the $7 billion woman a remarkable lady who has some surprising and ultimately very hopeful answers to that question. But first, let's see what they were pumping out in Wall Street in the week just past. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, the anniversary week of Pearl Harbor was marked by rumors of peace, and investors rejoiced both at the possibility that war will be avoided and the reality that interest rates, both long and short, are coming down. The Dow closed up for the second straight week, gaining more than 30 points to 2590.10 after moving above 2600 for the first time in more than two months. And the broader indexes all did even better than the Dow, with the greatest percentage gain in the suddenly alive over-the-counter market. Suddenly asleep, on the other hand, are our 10 chief elves, unmoved from last week's net plus one reading. Losers of the week continued to be gold, silver, and the dollar, while the runaway winner was the bond market, which likes peace, falling oil prices, and a weak economy, not necessarily in that order, and which soared to its highest level in nearly a year. And if you're in some doubt as to whom to include on your own Christmas list this year, be aware of a survey reported this week that found that when times get tough, 
people are more likely to drop their boss from their list than their pet. Proving, I suppose, that humans are much more willing than dogs to bite the hand that feeds them. <laughs> Carter Randall, is this just a bear market rally, or is the bull beginning to snort again? Um, the bull is, is snorting, but whether he can keep going or not is a question. I, I believe the market is very fairly valued. In fact, I believe it's selling at a discount to what money is really worth. And um, I think the market should go to the 27, 2800 uh, level. Whether it will or not uh, depends on the perception of not only the uh, length and depth of, of this recession in which we're in, but um, the perception of what corporate earnings are going to do. That, that in the final analysis, will, will be the pricing of the market. What's your perspective on corporate earnings? My perspective is in the mainstream of this that we're going to have a soft landing recession uh, that will last for two or three quarters, uh, but not be severe, that we will see a turnaround in the economy in mid-1991 and through 1992, and that the market will start to anticipate that uh, comeback uh, at least early in 1991. So, so we're, we're near the end of the bad news. Here. I think um, we're going to start to be anticipating a recovery as opposed to uh, lingering with a recession. So I would be a buyer and holder of stocks with a little bit of powder dry uh, for unforeseen events. We'll have a few months, though, in which people say, how come the market's up and the economy's down? Oh, well, there's no question about that. The market goes up on bad news. How come? But the market is thinking of the good news ahead. Gail Dudak, you're one of our two remaining absolutely bearish panelists, so you clearly don't buy this. Is that correct? Um, yes and no. I'm still bearish, but I don't think I'm as bearish as I was a year ago, because I think that in the course of the last year, a lot of stocks have really been pummeled. And while I think the Dow will go to lower lows than what we've seen in, this, in the recent past, I think that a, a good number of stocks probably did see their lows in the last few months. And they'll retest those lows and probably not go lower. Well, as, as one of our chief elves, are you considering raising your signal? <laughs> I will when I think it's uh, safe to enter the water. And that is where I think you can really go into the marketplace and make money being long. And I, I'm not convinced that, it, that it's time yet. Are you telling your customers to buy any stocks now? No. I think that uh, you should be raising cash in this rally because I do think the averages will go lower. And I think th one of the things that would make me much more optimistic is if we could see a, a, a narrowing in what I see as a P.E. spread, which is too high. I think that there are still some favorite stocks that are trading with P.E.s of 20 times, maybe 30 times. And at, a, at the end of a bear market, you just don't see that. You see a narrowing in that spread. The so market's now at 12 times. So anyone who didn't get out when you told them to a year ago, you think should still get out now? I think I'm very, I'm very bearish on, on relatively high P.E. stocks. And if you can find stocks trailing, uh, working, at, uh, trading at a, a 10 P.E. or less, and there are stocks trading at, a, at five times earnings, those I might be interested in, but not the 30 times. Lou Holland, Gail basically wants us to get out. Carter says it's going to be pretty big starting in early 91. You can... Be, just be the broker and make the trades between the two of them, or you can mention your own view. <laughs> right. Basically, I believe that uh, the rally probably will continue. However, I think we're near the end of what I would consider to be a bear market rally. Uh, going back to 1900, the typical bear market rally has been about 9%, lasting about six or seven weeks. Well, we've had about a 10% gain off the bottom here in mid-October, uh, lasting about eight weeks. And, of course, if you relate that back to 1973 and 74, which is when we had a nasty bear market where the market was down something like 40 to 45 percent, in 1973, we had a 14 percent rally that lasted about eight weeks, and we had a 12 percent rally that lasted about uh, four weeks. So I think it's very possible that we're in the similar kind of situation. The market probably is going to go higher. We've had a glorious bond market here. We've had some easing of the tension in the Middle East. And I think all of these things basically are, have been good news to the market, and the market basically is sort of stalled here. So you think we, we may be running out of good news? I think so. Are you pr grim on the outlook for the economy next year? I think that it's going to be worse than the consensus of, uh, of two quarters of down uh, GNP growth, soft landing. Uh, and again, I think there's too much debt in the system. And uh, I suspect that, um, that we've already been in the recession for some very major sectors of the economy, such as autos and housing. And so, you know, whether or not we have a recession in the technical sense, um, you know, I guess it's still debatable. But certainly, I think the recession is going to be worse than the consensus. 
All righty. Now, this is the point in the program when we normally pause for a round of viewer questions. Tonight, though, that time goes to your local public television station so you can make a significant investment in its fine work. I hope you will. And next week, we'll be back to answering your pleas for help, so keep them coming to us here at Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, a super optimist on the long term, at a time when gloom is the fashion, let's see why, despite all the global pessimism, she can't wait for the future. In her much rosier crystal ball, she sees not just the end of the Cold War, but as one of the byproducts of that happy event, the expansion of capitalism worldwide. Stock exchanges will proliferate in places where other philosophies recently held sway, and there will be many more shareholders around the planet. Moreover, people whose horizons used to end at their own country's borders will now look far beyond and investing internationally will become the norm. This will lead to other surprisingly favorable developments, she believes, as the increase in investing offsets temporary capital shortages and the international demand for income and stability makes its own contribution to world peace and prosperity. Not exactly what you read on page one of your newspaper today, is it? Is this lady just dreaming? Or is the world truly on the brink of a global go-go decade? For some thoughts on that, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, Christina Sykes. Chris, welcome. Very pleased to have you here tonight. Thank you. Christina Sykes is a native New Yorker who has taken the town's financial community by storm. A top-ranked money manager, she became in 1987 the chairman and CEO of Mackay Shields Financial Corporation, an investment firm that manages some $7 billion in assets. And she added to her own production this past June when her daughter Lindsay was born. Chris, if the future is so terrific, why is everybody looking so scared? Well, Lou, it's important to take a step back from the capital markets and really put in perspective some of the unusual developments that you spoke about in the introduction. You, though, uh, very bullish on the long run, are in fact a little cautious about the immediate future, are you not? Absolutely, yes. Would you t give us your view on that? Okay. We believe that probably in early October you did begin the slowdown in the economy, that we did move into a recession, and that that will last probably until the end of next year. And, well, it'll be very, very bullish for the bond market. It won't be too good for the stock market near term. By the first half of 1991, you will probably bottom out in the stock market, and prospects will improve there, too. So your basic investment recommendation is to buy bonds? Absolutely. The longer, the better. The higher quality, the better. And the more call protected, the better. So you hang on to those coupons for the entire duration. Well, let's, let's try and be specific on that for those who don't deal with this every day. Are you talking about U.S. Treasury bonds? Are you talking about the highest quality corporate bonds? And if so, what quality? Uh, absolutely. U.S. Treasury bonds would be the ideal. Uh, they are now at an 820 yield as of close of business tonight. We expect that they'll be going down to somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to 7 and a quarter percent. The maturity is anywhere from 10 to 30 years, not too short to lock in those capital gains. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, corporates, have to be careful there. Double A and triple A quality would be our recommendation. The, the best idea for an individual would really be to buy a mutual fund managed by a professional organization as opposed to selecting individual securities. Uh, we at Mackay Shields manage a, a series of mutual funds that is distributed by the New York Life, and that's the kind of investment vehicle that we'd recommend you'd use. You wouldn't be buying stocks yet? Not yet. Probably in the first part of 1991. And do you have your eye on which categories or kinds of stocks you want to buy? Well, there are quite a few interesting themes out there. Uh, the first we'd point out is growth stocks with a worldwide consumer franchise. And by that I mean companies that have a good solid percentage of their revenues overseas. Uh, companies that actually take advantage of uh, strong consumer developments, increasing personal income overseas, uh, increasing standards of living. Companies like what? 
Well, one that comes to mind is a toy company, like Toys R Us, for example. There's a company that, while it doesn't have a distressed PE multiple, it certainly has a multiple that is very, very attractive today. It's a company that will take advantage of younger markets overseas, uh, increasing uh, standards of living, and will grow very, very dramatically over the next 10 years. We would say 20 to 25 percent. If you wouldn't buy even a stock like that that you like yet, you must think that the market's going to go lower in the near term. Is that correct? Probably. We are now in a bear market rally. It could go a little higher near term, but by the first part of next year, our guess would be 2,200, possibly even 2,100 on the Dow. But that's a real buying opportunity. Now, uh, many people who looked at what we just showed about your long-term philosophy would say it's a pipe dream. The world's awash in debt. There are stresses and strains politically and economically all over the world. We could be having a much more serious recession than is now being forecast. What do you reply to those people? Well, again, it's important to take a look at the long-term picture and not just near-term knowledge. Uh, overseas, as we said earlier, you're going to have uh, the development of capital markets. You're going to have strong demand in terms of cash flow. You're really going to see something that is a revolution in terms of the way we look at the capital markets. At the same time, here, while we have a very developed capital market, you'll see a different situation. You'll see an evolution in the demand for securities. And what I'm referring to there is the aging of the population here. We're going to move the baby boomers to a more mature set. They'll become uh, the buyers of securities in the future. And so, so what will happen is that you'll have demand here from a savings rate moving up and from the consumption crowd moving into a more savings crowd. And then you have the revolution, the capital markets expanding overseas. So revolution abroad, evolution in the U.S. It's a decade that really has historic investment opportunities. We've assembled three well-known revolutionaries to talk with you tonight. Let's start with Carter Randall. Chris, the single biggest stock holding uh, in America of individuals are utility stocks. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people own utility stocks as sort of bond substitutes, good yields, and increasing dividends from time to time. They've done very well in anticipation of lower interest rates. Is this a time, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, for people to sell those stocks and buy bonds? Absolutely. Uh, we think utility stocks at this point are probably a little overvalued. And if you do believe in a very bullish interest rate forecast, as we do, uh, we think that the move is sell the utility stocks and buy pure long-term government bonds. And increase your income in the process. Absolutely. And, and lock it in. Christine, you were talking about global themes and, and the U.S. has finally become global and in the first half of this year U.S. investors bought over six billion dollars of foreign stocks while foreigners were, were sellers of six billion U.S. stocks. So mm -hmm. globalization hasn't helped the U.S. market so far this year. Are, are the US, is the U.S. investor right? Are there better opportunities abroad? And if there are, can you tell us some? Uh, it depends on what you're looking at. We think if you take a longer term view, uh, there are very, very interesting areas in the international bond markets as well as stock markets. Uh, just some uh, footnotes on that. We think the dollar is very undervalued, so it's a difficult time to go heavily into the over in, into the overseas markets we we caution against that but in terms of looking at stock markets over there very very attractive we underweight japan still at this point in terms of bond markets uh, looking at markets for example like the french bond market uh, the dutch bond market where you get a yield increment over german bonds but you still are linked to a very strong currency would be attractive areas christina you've suggested that you think a year from now the long bond could be at 7%. Well, how can that be if, in fact, uh, the German bond, for example, which is currently yielding at a premium, both on a, on a nominal and a real basis, mm -hmm. uh, far greater than the U.S., so what's to, you know, to say that people shouldn't put their money in, in German bonds? Well, again, it depends on expectations. Now, Germany is about to integrate another whole country into their economy. So there's a lot of debt going on in Germany. Uh, there is a little bit of inflation over there, and they are stronger as an economy than we are. Uh, their GNP is probably going from a 6% rate to a 3% rate. We're probably going into a negative GNP situation. And our inflation prospects, something we haven't touched on yet, uh, are very, very attractive. We believe, for example, that the Fed has been, up to this week, fighting yesterday's war. 
that they've been worried about money supply expansion and worrying about inflation getting out of control. Meanwhile, you have commodities crumbling. You have gold down 15% this year. You have oil from the, uh, the $40 price in late September down 35%. So we have a Fed that has kept money supply at less than 2% growth rates, if you look at an M3 measure, for example. Very, very tight. Uh, commodities sinking. Inflation very, very low. And we think that's tremendously bullish for the U.S. markets. Chris, we're nearly out of time. If inflation is yesterday's war, what's going to be the big problem for the 90s? Uh, the big problems for the 90s is debt. It is leverage. We do have a situation, for example, where uh, we had bankruptcies in 1989 of about $3 billion in the U.S. markets. In 1990, just through October, it was $11 billion, and we're not in a recession yet. So we have to keep our eye on the debt situation here. Thanks very much, Chris Sykes. Thanks to our panel. Hope you'll be back with us again next year. Next week, rather. Not next year yet. And we'll take you on both sides of the movie screen for the holiday season. With top entertainment analyst Harold Vogel, we'll take a look at what's hot and who's producing it for those who might want to make some gold out of the silver screen. And we're reserving a starring role for you in our fascinating cast of characters. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser has been made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. By the Travelers, insurance and related financial services working to provide financial peace of mind for American business. By Enron, providing natural gas which holds the promise for a cleaner world and a more energy independent America. Enron Corp. and the Enron Foundation. And by Prudential Beach Securities. Rock solid. Market wise. Local acquisition and broadcast costs for Wall Street Week have been underwritten by grants from the Helen and Walter Bender Memorial Fund through the trustees of Bank One Youngstown and Butler Wick and Company, with nine offices in Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania. In these troubled times, so many of you out there turn to Wall Street Week for advice. I know how much this program means to you right now, and right now is the time that you need to become a member of Channels 45 and 49 and support this kind of quality public affairs programming. You do that by calling 1-800-672-4549. Use our installment plan, $5, $10, $15 a month, whatever is appropriate for your family's budget. But do make that call. Do pledge your support because this kind of quality programming has to be funded by someone. It's not funded by the federal or state government. It's funded by people out there in their homes, one telephone call at a time. You know, there are 25,000 families out there who are already members of channels 45 and 49. We are asking you to make one more phone call. Become a member of pub your public television stations, channels 45 and 49. Pledge your support for this kind of quality programming right now. My name's Pat Batone. I'm from the staff of channels 45 and 49. And in our studio with me is Steve Mitchell, our director of instructional services. And he's going to get you to call right now. That's right, Pat. Uh, we've got lots of good volunteers from the Summit County School Media Specialists, and they're waiting to take your calls. They're very nice people. We'll only take them about 60 seconds to uh, take down the information we need to get your pledge dollars to come rolling to us so that we can continue to bring good programs to you. Uh, what should you pledge? Well, that is really up to you. A lot of our uh, members are pledging a dollar a week. That's only $52 a year, and you can uh, do that in the installment plan, $5 a week, or $5 a month, rather. Uh, we'll bring that kind of money into you, or into us. Uh, we, we need your dollars because 60% of our operating budget comes from people just like you. Uh, one phone call at a time, and that takes a lot of phone calls. Uh, the phones aren't ringing now, so there must not be anybody out there watching. If this type of programming is important to you, you need to call us and let us know that it's important. Pat? That's so right, Steve. You know, <laughs> the fact is that you're part of a small select audience. That's the kind of audience we appeal to here, to here on channels 45 and 49. So the odds are the guy down the street isn't watching. They're not going to be calling. You need to make that call because this program is important.
to you. And it's only going to take about 30 seconds of your time to become a member, and, and I'd urge you to do it right now. You know, we've got some exciting news. Many of the cable companies in Northeast Ohio have joined together and are challenging you to become a member of your public television station at the $100 level or greater. If you do do that tonight, they'll be giving you one month's free basic cable service or free installation if you live in a wired serviceable area and aren't already a cable subscriber. So if you are a cable subscriber now, one month's basic service. If you're not a cable subscriber yet, but you live in a community that has cable, they'll give you free installation. It's another, just one more great reason for becoming a member right now. You know, as I said, it takes about 30 seconds of your time, and you'll be a member for the rest of the year, knowing that you help bring these quality programs into your home and homes all over Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania. Now, the real reason you want to become a member is because these are quality programs, because you see the best programs here on your public television station. Now, here are some of the quality programs you'll see on 4549, and some other great reasons for you to call right now. Imagine a place where the universe is celebrated, where you can hear music in infinite variety, and witness dance performed with breathless emotion. Imagine a place where the mind is sharpened and the spirit can soar. A place where nature whispers its secrets and where children find joy in learning. Every day, public television challenges your imagination with meaningful, magical programs. We bring you and your family a universe of ideas and emotions, all in one very special place. Offer your gift of support to imaginative entertainment worth watching. Call right now with a pledge. We have 751 new members so far this pledge drive. Last break, we had a goal of 15 members, but we didn't quite make, make it. We got 12, but that's not enough. We need 15 more members this pledge break to make up for last pledge break. So if you're sitting at home and not getting on the phone to call, now's the time to do it. Uh, step right up and give us a call. How much should you pledge? Well, that's up to you, but we can do an installment plan for you, $5 a week is, or $5 a month is only $60 a year. $10 a month is only $120 a year. $15 a month, $188 a year. Or you can design your own. You can do uh, $10 a month for three months. That'll give us $30 a year, and that will bring you the alternative, uh, our program guide that tells you all about the wonderful programs that are on the entire month on channels 45, 49. But the way it happens is one phone call at a time. That's why you have to get up and go to that phone and give us a call. Pat? Thanks so much. You know, we're going to be going to the McLaughlin Group in just about a minute or so, but right now, you still have the opportunity to pledge your support for quality public affairs programming. You know, when you become a member of Channels 45 and 49, you'll receive a viewer preference poll in the mail. You'll fill that out, and you'll tell our Director of Programming, Don Freeman, the kinds of programs that you want to see on your public television station, because that's what we are. We're your public television station members supported. We're Channels 45 and 49. WNEO in Alliance, WEAO in Akron. Now, our, our operators will still be here after the program begins, so give us a call, 800-672-4549. Enjoy the program and call now. If you were unable to make your pledge by phone, you can become a member of Channels 45 and 49 by sending your contribution to Channels 45 and 49, Kent, Ohio, 44240-5191. Local broadcast of the McLaughlin Group is made possible in part by the Ameritech companies, providing state-of-the-art communications in Ohio and throughout the Midwest. From the nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue one. Sodom plays Santa. 
I call upon you, brothers, to lift the travel ban on all foreigners with our apologies for all harm and our petition for forgiveness from God Almighty. So said Saddam Hussein to the Iraqi parliament this week as he released some 2,000 hostages of all nations being held in Iraq and Kuwait. President Bush and Secretary of State Baker welcomed the hostage action, but in very subdued tones, holding the focus intensely and tenaciously on Iraq's aggression against Kuwait. I don't care about face. He doesn't need any face. He needs to get out of Kuwait without trying to complicate this matter by uh, talking about some Middle East peace settlement or peace conference. And it is clear what his ploy is, and that ploy is not going to be successful. If we want a peaceful solution, it should be crystal clear to them that force is not going to be ruled out as an option. It is a real, live, credible option. And you appreciate and that's what I say I, to you those. Wait just a minute. You asked me the question. You let me answer this one. Que just let me answer the question. That is my answer to you when you say, when you say, uh, wait, 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 wait. That undercuts a strategy that is showing every possibility of working, Mr. Hamilton. Baker joined Bush in stressing that the U.S. is not engaged in any backstairs, face-saving quid pro quo with Saddam Hussein, notably an international peace conference, even though the U.S. has been and is open to such an idea for later. We have taken the position for a long time that an international conference, properly structured, at an appropriate time, might be useful. This is certainly not an appropriate time for an international conference. Pat Buchanan, what's the impact of this stunning news? John, the, the hostages were a depreciating asset for Saddam Hussein. He traded them in now for improved atmospherics for the next six weeks of negotiations. We are at end game or approaching it. Saddam Hussein has gotten from Bush and Baker a guarantee that we will not attack if he gets out of Kuwait. What he's relying on now is two things. One of them is the Congress of the United States to impose the sanction strategy and de facto take away the military threat from George Bush before the 15th of uh, January. And the second one is, since Mr. Baker is going to Baghdad, that's going to set off a stampede. And I think Saddam Hussein wants to negotiate with the French and the Europeans who might be coming, and maybe with the Americans to break down the coalition. I think we're at end game, and it's dealing basically with Kuwait. Fred Bonds. Yeah, that was actually, for the first time in a long time, I agreed with uh, a lot of what uh, Pat has said. You know, one thing is clear that, that, uh, is that Saddam Hussein is reacting to the pressure, the military pressure, for one, that's put on him. The extra 200,000 troops, the UN resolution, uh, Defense Secretary Dick Cheney's testimony that we can use, we should use force soon, and we don't even need to go to Congress uh, for the authorization. He's feeling the pinch, and the thing to do now is rather than say, uh, "We'll free you from any uh, fear of the mili of our use of the military option for the next eight or ten months," but continue to say force is imminent if you don't get out of Kuwait, and he might get out. Jack him on. Um, he he might. The. Um uh, Saddam has shown that he, that he is very good at playing the sort of international public diplomatic game on CNN. He's, he has this, this uh, knack. And what he's done by, by releasing the hostages is this. He's taken away the best emotional justification, emotional factor in the justifications that President Bush uses for the hard line and, and for a war. We're now back to basics. We're now back in a situation where you're saying the only justification for doing this thing, we've, he's dropped the nuclear capable capacity argument. We're back and saying that we can only attack in the interest of getting them out of Kuwait, period. And essentially, we're, going to, we're only going to attack because they've got oil, not soybeans, period. That makes it much harder for the president to do this, and it makes the argument for, if, for continued extended sanctions much stronger. If, I, if, if, a, if a bank robber goes into the bank and takes hostages and, and has the sacks of money, and then he decides to release the hostages because the cops are outside. You don't kiss his hand and say, "Oh, please take the money." I'm not. I'm not. So, so, I'm not so talking what, about. So I'm not Baker... talking about what. I'm not talking about what is reasonable, logical, fair, equitable. More. I'm talking about the real Bush, world. But Bush is doing the right thing by saying, "Uh-uh, Saddam, out of Kuwait, or we're coming after you." Now, if if he doesn't get out of Kuwait, the issue then is, do we actually go to war, or do we uh, conduct a siege? And frankly, I think there's a lot to be said for the siege. 
Well, this, well, the, well, well, well. Zbigniew well. Brzezinski. No, wait yes, a minute. Hold it. Just All a right, second. Let's pass. Let me respond. Zbigniew Brzezinski you this week the made, made a very good argument for the siege. What you want, though, yes. is to give him Bubion Island and give him the, and give him the oil fields look. and all that. I Mr. want him Kondracki, out. Mr. Kondracki, look. If the United States and Mr. Bush had followed the insane advice of your crazy little magazine <laughs> and found a pretext back in August and gone to war and bombed him, the hostages would all be dead and the 82nd Airborne would have been cut to pieces. Mr. Bush deserves high marks for patience, and he ought to maintain... I still, still, have, oh, wait a minute. I still, haven't, I still haven't heard why Saddam Hussein has released all the hostages. I think... Can I, you I, tell me? Well, I told they, you. they weren't doing Yeah, but anything. I haven't heard it here. Do I have to tell they you? Wanted to re I'll tell you. Set a new I'll atmosphere. tell you. Okay, he released the hostages because it's part of the deal. Uh -huh. If he wants Jim Baker to go to Baghdad... The only way Jim Baker would consent to do that is if he released all the hostages. Because there's no, no, no way no, no. a United States Secretary yeah. of State John, would go to Baghdad with one, with 1,000 Americans he was being going, held hostage John. by that they government. Was, that he was going, he was going John, anyway. but that what story. it did was it took away a little bit of the moral high ground on which Baker was going to sit, let him go, and it left Good. it down to what Jack is talking there's about. Not, we're I'm talking telling about you there was a deal between both governments. Well, that yeah. Baker was Baker would not go to Baghdad unless the hostages were That's released. Story. That, that story, let, that story let me, is remaining let, exclusive. Let me let me uh, let me uh, interrupt your um, uh, peregrination. My theory, <laughs> your, your conspiracy, <laughs> your, your conspiracy theory to make another uh, another point. People, another thing that happened interesting right before this, is that this talk that we heard, including from Fred and Mort about how we, this could all be done with air power and so forth. Yes. And it could be done relatively painlessly. I think that's Colin, true. Colin Powell doesn't think it's true. And when, yeah. his testimony was that, it, in fact, it would require all kinds of force, massive force, and the strong implication was massive casualties as well. That's and that is why they're bad. And in fact, that's not what they believe at the Pentagon. They've oh, obviously Colin Powell going to use... No, no. Colin not, Powell doesn't believe it? Powell did not say, Jack, that this entails massive casualties. No, he, he didn't. said it entails massive use of force. a lot of land force. It doesn't mean you send them in Verdun style, attacking the mm -hmm. uh, Iraqi troops by the border. You don't do that. It's air power led, and then ground troops are used. Right. You see that the Iraqi government is billing the British government three hundred thousand dollars for room and board for the British hostages. <laughs> I wonder if they had a cut rate if you were if you were being held as a shield at one of the poison gas hey, factories. John, hey John, huh? yeah, you think I'm they mistaken, had a cut rate? Does that tell you how wait, Saddam Hussein does business? Am, you I got mistaken, am I mistaken or not, or do you look a lot like the church lady? Uh, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and Dana Harvey would actually be a very good host for the show. Listen to this, huh? <laughs> hey, John, you've left out. He's mad point. because it was Eleanor who was sitting in that chair and not him. Hey, hey, John, if it's you know Tuesday, what? it must be Uruguay. John, you know what? I can live with it. You've left out an important aspect here, and that's what the Democrats are doing now in, in criticizing the Bush policy. It's not that they're unpatriotic, but they also realize that if you have Bush strung out with a 12-month or 18-month embargo you know, where they enforce delay and in, in, in inaction, real problem it's going to chop him apart I know politically. It, but there's a real problem here, and one is everybody realizes that Bush is much stronger in getting the guy out peacefully if he's got the whip hand. But the president's problem is he gets up constantly and he acts as though we're going to go to war tomorrow and everybody says, that's well, called it. If it's, it's Tuesday, all if it's Tuesday, it must be Uruguay. President Bush this week <laughs> orbited in six days through Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Venezuela, and the whirlwind trip had a triple purpose, to give a pat on the back to new democracies, to promote Bush's initiative called Enterprise for the Americas, and to heal wounds inflicted by the U.S. invasion of Panama one year ago this month. Bush's enterprise initiative encourages freer trade and foreign investment. But at every stop, the president was bombarded with queries about the Gulf crisis, which leads to the question, what's the political logic of having the president move through South America in the middle of the Gulf crisis? I ask you, Morton. I think it, it turned out very well, actually. He, he told the, the Latin Americans that even though there's this huge crisis going on around the world, I'm here down here with you. <laughs> secondly, same secondly, logic as being a Terry Bunkhorn, namely that he's not going to no be held. No he's way, not going to be held. Look, look, he's not going to be held hostage in the White House by Saddam Hussein. This is a Wait. CNN, CNN 
diplomacy world, right? This was you can con you can conduct your worldwide diplomacy just as easily on television from what Chile. Does he get, you what does he want to get? Wait a minute, what does he want to get out of those South American countries? A free trade agreement that will there will be a no, no, from the North no, Pole no, no. to he the wants South the, Pole. He wants, the, he wants their help in the GATT agreements, which just about ready to go right down the chute. Right, that's and what he wants. Right, and he'll get it. Look, this, this, this whole, yeah. help is important. This yeah. whole um, this whole South American trip. Talk about a page 37 story. That's what it is. It's and it has been all along. Never mind the Persian Gulf. The economy is in collapse, for God's no. sake. And the president John, is running around South that America because he, he likes to ride around there. Around, he's John. running around our backyard. He's running around the future. This it is, is all... not, you know, the trouble is, it is the future of the United States. Brazil and Argentina between them have almost $200 billion in debt. This country of ours is going in debt to the tune of about $400 billion a year in deficits added onto the debt. What he's seeing down there is exactly what's going to happen here if they don't get back and shape up the American economy. You support John. the trip that he just took to South America? I don't America. have any problem with it. What it is to show off John, that we got new democracies instead of the He is killing two set. birds with one stone. He is courting these new South American democracies and pounding Saddam Hussein on CNN every day. <laughs> All right, on, on a continuum between the polarities of a deal at one end of the continuum and a war at the other end, how far did we advance to either polarity this week? Zero meaning zero advance, a hundred meaning arrived and your bags unpacked. You follow me? <laughs> I ask you. I think we're about, um, Saddam Hussein said 50-50, John. I think we're about 60-40 toward a deal, and one reason is Jimmy Baker, James Baker, is a deal maker. He's not a war minister, and if he cuts a deal, he gets a Nobel Peace Prize, and if he walks away with the war, I think he's a loser. And James I think he's Baker going for a deal. The, James Baker is emerging as a huge winner, is he not? No. If, and maybe, if he with, gets his, this maybe deal, with his presidential uh, ambition Let me tell you something, now, John. What? If he cuts a deal, and even they give up Bubion Island and the Romero oil, oil fields, the country will say Mr. Bush has won this face-off, and Jimmy Baker will be a hero. Look, yeah, more than that, Pat, what helps Bush it politically is the fact that the economy will, it will face a resurgence if we do get out with a deal, whereas the stock market will drop 300 to 500 points if there's a war. What do you think? <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> Catastrophe. Quickly, quickly, quickly. We, look, Bush is going to be the big winner if Saddam Hussein is run out of Kuwait. It's not going right. to be Jim Baker. Uh, the fact is the stuff was a little tippy-toe toward a deal. What do you say, Jack? Yeah, well, I think say, why don't we wait a little while to decide before we decide who the heroes of this thing are? I think I think it moved uh, significantly, though. Mm -hmm. Say seventy percent toward safety. Yes. I, what do you I think? I think it. I think it inch toward a deal, but everything depends on whether Saddam Hussein will get out of Kuwait, and I That's think true. he won't. Mart, you, Mart, you're such a holdout. You know the Soviets had sent a, a Japanese journalist into space. You think we could <laughs> arrange that for you? The answer is we've advanced seventy percent towards a deal. Issue two, paradigm pandemonium. After weeks of bitter sniping, Hill Republicans and White House Republicans had a little powwow this week. At issue, President Bush's domestic policies. A battle is raging over what White House aide Jim Pinkerton calls the new paradigm. The new paradigm consists of five principles of Republican policymaking. One, free market orientation. Two, choice. Three, empowerment of the poor. Four, decentralization. Five, emphasis on what works. In a nutshell, de-bureaucratize the government. Get rid of the middleman. For example, the plan calls for a government-funded school voucher system that would enable poor children to go to private schools. It calls for tenant ownership of public housing. It calls for tax incentives to curb pollution. House Minority Whip Newt Gingrich and other Hill Republicans hailed the new paradigm as the perfect GOP orientation for the 90s. But Budget Director Richard Dahman mocked the new paradigm in public addresses and on television, burlesquing it, saying, Brother, can you paradigm? Fred, you just wrote a devastating account of this feud in your schizoid rag. Would you care to speak about this now? Well, I try to use the word paradigm as much as I can in the pieces I write. Uh, the new paradigm is a symbol for what conservatives think should be the agenda of the Bush administration in the last two years, the post of his first term, the post-Reagan agenda, including deep tax cuts. And why it's important is this reason. 
The Republican Party is divided. The conservatives want some Reaganite, new paradigm, conservative uh, section in Bush's State of the Union speech. And if he doesn't take it, if Richard what's Darman... The, what's Darman's it, motive? Darman likes the budget agreement. He wants to hold the world static, mm -hmm. not reopen the tax code again. Does Darman also want to be the intellectual architect of the White well, House? that's why he attacked Pinkerton. Does he resent was, this guy, Pinkerton? Well, Pinkerton is a White House aide below uh, Darman's level who has a lot of ideas. That's his job. Darman resents How smart is Pinkerton? Is he as smart as Sununu? Uh, he's uh, not quite as smart, but he's taller. Is this, going to lead, <laughs> is this going to lead to the resignation of Darman? If Darman does not yield and let some of these new paradigm conservative ideas in the State of the Union and in the budget, he's going to be in Jack a lot of Kemp trouble. What's Jack Kemp saying about this? He is, well, he, he's another one who's on Pinkerton's side, and if, and he feels the same way. If tax cuts and so on are not in uh, Bush's agenda for the next two did years, Sununu Jack tell, Kemp may leave. Did Sununu tell him to shut up? He did. Did he then shut up? Uh, but it doesn't last for long. Is, is, <laughs> is Kemp capable of resigning on this issue? Absolutely. What about Sununo? How does he fit into this? Uh, he's uh, on a rampage, and uh, all he can do is talk about is, is uh, beat his fist on the table and say, is accept the budget. Final agreement. question, final right. question. is Sununu in trouble as far as staying out at the White House is concerned? Uh, he's on thin ice. What John, do you say, Jack? I'd say you've missed the point of the whole thing. What we have here is some political pygmies rolling around in the dust, punching each other out. You Gingrich, come on, <laughs> get, get serious. What, it, what the message is... Hey, I thought thing, you were saying the, recently that it was Newt Gingrich who was scuttled, the budget what, summit. What is, what is important in this thing, what's revealing about this, mm -hmm. is what it says about George Bush. Exactly. If George Bush stood for something, you wouldn't have Newt Gingrich arguing with John no, Sununu. John, what My is the Lord. fundamental problem with George Bush in this regard? Is it not true that he is totally bored with, with domestic George policy? Bush no, is the, fact, the, fact is he, the fact is that he has never said... I mean, the, the, the vision thing is not a joke. He never said what he wanted to do for the country John, when he ran for president look, ever. Look, what George Bush needs to do is to figure out what the country needs to do in the next eight, six years, you know, and then fashion a, a partly a Darman package and partly a Pinkerton package. They are not mutually exclusive. And you, could, and you could sell it to the country, raise the banner, call it what you want, new wave, new paradigm, whatever, and lead, you know. But, he, but he's, John, what, he's not paying attention. What is at issue now is whether or not these new paradigm ideas are going to find place within the State of the Union. Are you hearing anything? Uh, John, let me say, this is a Roosevelt Room food fight as of right now. I mean, they push these ideas back and forth. I've been in all those little battles before. The problem is, as Jack describes it, George Bush does not believe deeply in these ideas. George Bush is not going to go up there and fight on the Hill day and night, guerrilla warfare, to get a couple of them passed. Some of them are good ideas, and all put together, I don't like the new paradigm idea itself, I mean, just the title, but George Bush is not going to do battle for him, so it's going to be sort of irrelevant. Well, Bush's you... problem is the conservative antipathy for the president and lack of concern about his presidency in the conservative movement is widespread. Do you think that Dahman seriously miscalculated? No, he was a, it's a tactical error, but Dick Darman is now moving to say, but let's embrace see, some but of the he, ideas. But he's building but John, the whole but John, subject. But John, but John, John. Here's, why he here's why he miscalculated. The conservatives were furious. Kemp, Gingrich, all of them furious over the budget agreement. Then he goes and pokes them in the eye and mocks mm -hmm. them with this speech. That was a terrible but blunder. You're, but, but, you're, but, you know, the, all this focus on whether Dick Darman keeps his job or John Sununu or Jack Kemp, that's all garbage. What, what is, what, what, what is significant? About what, what time, is, I know, that's, mm -hmm. we sure do. But, but the, what, what is significant about this thing is this is a real rupture in the Republican Absolutely. Party. Let's get out on that and the, and the president is the leader of the Republican Party, and if he doesn't start leading, it's going to fall all, all right, in pieces. Absolutely. Assess the level of rupture of this present rift. A, is it like anything else in any other administration? B, is it serious? C, is it critical? D, is it civil war leading to a possible challenge from the right to George Bush in 1992? Well, right now it is, is between serious and critical. This is just a manifestation of something that is What do you say, deeper. quickly? It's easily critical and heading toward a serious challenge. Jack. Yeah, unless Bush acts... Critical. Forceful. What do you say? I agree. Critical. Critical. I say critical. <laughs>
spots the deer and lines it up through the rifle's crosshairs, game police push buttons. The buck's head turns, eyes the hunter, his tail twitching back and forth, thus enhancing the illusion. The hunter's heart begins to pound. He takes a last look at the prey, then pulls the trigger. Presto, the game warden jumps out of the bushes and arrests the startled would-be deer slayer. Robo deer have snared over 120 hunters since November. Robo deer's hide is riddled with bullets, but its controlling mechanism has never been struck. Concealed as it is in that private part of the buck's anatomy, that hunters never target. Is this process entrapment and therefore illegal, or is it, as the game police say, trickery, yes, entrapment, no, I ask you. <laughs> oh, boy. You, you have... Um... You have brought triviality to a new height. I mean, the, no. uh, the <laughs> fact that entrapment is not the fact, trivial. The fact is, the look fact, at look at the, the fact look at how Mayor these, Barry defended himself. The fact is that hunters hunters know what the rules are. If they break the rules, they ought to get arrested and pay a fine. That's what happens. What do you say? I think uh, I think you you did that entire segment so that you could get the, <laughs> where the control mechanism was, John. You, you're fixated. John, you're fascinated. John, how, can you, how can you? What are they charging with? I mean, there's a discharge of a fire. Shooting firearm? a deer from the road. But you can't. You call it a deer. It's not a deer. And I take your call. I say, Betts and get out of here. That's not a was deer. Abscam, Jack, was Abscam good for the country well, or wasn't it? Well, that's a very good case. Right. It was the, a real bribe. I'll tell right. those guys' well, lawyer yeah. to get a hold of you. What's, right? the, what's the moral, a larger lesson of this whole phenomenon? A larger lesson? There's no larger lesson. What do you mean there's John, no larger lesson? There's John, a larger John, lesson in everything. There, John, John, that's an unbelievable listen. temptation to have that thing. You're driving by in a truck. Some guy picks out his... <laughs> that's a exactly. flam. It's too Look, much of a temptation. The real problem for hunters is not that. It's these uh, animal rights people running around the woods scaring <laughs> off the animal. Predictions, Pat. Gorbachev will crack down on one of the Baltic states, I think, by the end of the year, John, because with his new power he's got, the president will remain relatively silent, and I think you'll have another firestorm about the president, what he gave away to get that deal at the United Nations. Fred, what you need is not a new paradigm, but a new pair of pants. Prediction. <laughs> I think these pants are all right. <laughs> Prediction, quickly. <laughs> Senator Phil Graham of Texas is going to try to emerge as the arbiter of Bush's agenda for next year. He's bringing together in a summit meeting the White House and conservatives. Uh, uh, Jack. Uh, the, uh, I, I, think, I, I think that this, this uh, State of the Union is likely to be unsatisfactory to the, to the ideologues and that you're going to have three or four of them gone, including Jack Kemp, within a year. Whoa. What do you say, Mark? Uh, governor Pete Wilson, when he becomes governor, will appoint not Condi Rice of the National Security Council staff to be the, uh, the replacement senator, but Gaddy Vasquez, a Los Angeles County supervisor. Uh, more trouble in Romania. Watch for another Romanian revolution. Violence uh, this week at the anniversary of Ceausescu's overthrow. Democracy is not working there. Next week, Polish presidential runoff election. Happy Hanukkah. Bye-bye. The McLaughlin Group. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. Local broadcast of the McLaughlin Group is made possible in part by the Ameritech companies providing state-of-the-art communications in Ohio and throughout the Midwest. Certainly hope you got some good information from uh, John and his crew. They always are a lively uh, organization to sit down and try to figure out what really goes on behind those headlines, behind those 30-second uh, news stories on radio or those 15-second news bites on TV. They're good. No, nobody can deny that ABC, NBC, and CBS uh, will bring you a great deal of uh, overall information, but I think you can uh, readily see that no one other than public television will bring you the insightfulness that you'll get throughout uh, our Friday evening with, uh, with the uh, McNeil Air News Hour, Washington Week, Wall Street Week, and the McLaughlin Group. And normally on a Friday night, we'll bring you some great local business within business, but tonight we're going to push them aside for just a second so we can uh, ask you to go to your telephone and help support the program that you just got through watching. Great information here because of the great members we have right now, all 25,000 families in Northeast Ohio. Are you one of them? Thank you very much. We appreciate that. But if you're not, please go to the phone right now. Dial the number you see on the screen and make your pledge of support to keep that program on the air. My name is Don Freeman. I'm program director for the stations. 
And on the other side of the studio is Lisa Martinez, who's in charge of advertising and promotion. Lisa? Thanks. Uh, we are waiting to hear from you right now. If you uh, uh, like McLaughlin Group and you really count on it being here every Friday night at 9 o'clock, please call 1-800-672-4549. $5 a month or $10 a month on our installment plan will make you a member. A dollar a week will make you a member. We're very flexible. We're not going to tell you how much to pledge, but we are going to tell you pledge right now. This is the opportunity for you to become a member of channels 45 and 49 and support a program like McLaughlin Group. I, I talk to a lot of people who watch this program because believe me, we had preempted it a few times in the past and you guys go wild when that happens and so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> We're afraid of you because you're, you're very strong old people. Uh, but nonetheless, if you return for that, we expect that you'll support this program. We, we, our statistics show that about 18,000 households are tuning into this on a Friday night. That means quite what, about 40,000 people perhaps. That's a lot of people watching this program, but not one of our phones is ringing, and that doesn't make any sense. That's uh, uh, kind of contradictory. You know, this program, I don't believe, airs on commercial TV anymore, does it? It, it used to be in the Saturday, Sunday morning thing, that's right, and they, they booted it. But it's right here on channels 45 and 49, and aren't you glad about that? If you are, please, uh, only 6 in 100 households uh, who watch the station support it. That means that 94% of you are not doing your fair share, so we urge you to please Get up and go to that telephone right now and support this station. And when you do call, you will have your phone answered by the Summit County School Media Specialists. We appreciate them taking their uh, Friday night off to be with us. It's wonderful volunteers like uh, that that uh, help keep the cost down here on channels 45 and 49 and make your dollars stretch that much further. Uh, Lisa said that we're not going to tell you how much to pledge. We'll give you a good hint. Uh, if you join at uh, $30 or more, you'll get the program guide, the alternative for a full year. But we're suggesting that you uh, be average, and the average right now is a little bit over $53. So how about a dollar a week for public TV? A dollar a week. What do you subscribe to a newspaper or a magazine, uh, to all of your other information sources? What does it cost you on a weekly basis to be well informed? Well, if you just, like many people, just got through sitting through an hour or more of the public affairs programming here on 4549, is that time worth a dollar a week to you? It should be. It really should be. It's, it's a very, very small expense in your budget, and it certainly is worth your time right now to get up and go to that telephone and dial the number you see and pledge a dollar a week for public TV. And on your way over there, glance at the TV, if you would, because we'll show you some of the quality programs you'll see here on 4549, give you some great reasons why you ought to call right now. Imagine a place where the universe is celebrated, where you can hear music in infinite variety and witness dance performed with breathless emotion. Imagine a place where the mind is sharpened and the spirit can soar. A place where nature whispers its secrets and where children find joy in learning. Every day, public television challenges your imagination with meaningful, magical programs. We bring you and your family a universe of ideas and emotions, all in one very special place. Offer your gift of support to imaginative entertainment worth watching. here next to our tote board and as you can see we are looking for 2,000 new members during this pledge campaign we're up to 755 now if you haven't made your phone call yet please do you know that that's that, that spot just told you uh, you know to that uh, uh, you know that, about how great public television is I was at a loss for words there for a minute uh, and I know that you know how great public television it is well right now is the time to make your voice heard you know most of you don't hesitate to do that and I'm not making fun but it, it you you know yeah, generally public TV viewers are also people with very strong ideas and people who who are very solid in their beliefs and and feelings and opinions and tastes and if that's the case and, and, and you feel strongly about what you're seeing here on channels 45 and 49, call the 1-800 number you see on your screen right now. $5 a month or $10 a month on our installment plan is really a small price to pay for the kind of programming you're getting back on a regular basis. A dollar a week uh, will get you the monthly program guide. In fact, $30 or more a year will get you the monthly program guide here at channels 45 and 49. And you can pay $5 a month for the next six months to take advantage of that. But we really should get done. What do you think? Maybe... I would think at least 10 pledges during this break. I know there are an awful lot of you out there who watch this program, to who, for whom this program is very important and very valuable. Let's hear from you right now. Don? Uh, if you are sitting there waiting for Jukebox Saturday night to come on, Patty Page will be on in just a minute, so please be patient. We will get to the program in literally just a matter of minutes. But if you are one of those people who is sitting there waiting for the show, maybe you value your time, and if you do, 
Spend your time wisely. Call right now and join channels 4549. Become a member of the family of 4549, all 25,000 households who are currently members. We would like to include you in that if you would call right now, won't you? And we've got a great deal for you. The Cable System Operators Challenge is uh, available to you if you can join at the level of $100 a year or more. Uh, on our installment plan, that could be $9 a month or $10 a month, however you'd like to stretch that out, or you can certainly write a check or do a Visa or MasterCard. But the, uh, the cable systems you see on the screen right now and others here in northeastern Ohio are able to offer you free basic cable for a month or, if you're not connected to cable, a uh, free uh, hookup uh, if you're in a wired serviceable area if you can call right now and join at the level of $100 a year or more. And that's, again, it's only $10 a month. So when you call, why don't you consider that? If you're not connected to cable, think of the wide opportunities and the varieties of programs you can see there and all of the joy you'll have knowing that your dollars help support the programs here on 4549. We, we have volunteers pledging now, and I think that's terrific. <laughs> Somebody here just joined. Uh, we asked for 10 of you to please call during this break. We have only five more to go. If you haven't made that call, please. You know, I, I don't know if you want to wait till the very end when the, you know, the adrenaline is running wild and we're almost screaming and frothing at the mouth. But every pledge counts. Every one, every one pledge we get gets us closer to that goal. And that goal is not drawn out of the air. That's a goal that we need to meet in order to bring you these kinds of programs. So please, do your part right now. Do it while you're watching the program you like best. This is really a way we get a, a tally for what our viewers want to see. And particularly our members. Our members' voices are here, heard, <laughs> are heard here on channels 45 and 49. We really listen to our members. After all, they're the ones who are giving us the dollars that we need uh, to, be, uh, to buy the programs. As you can see, there are your various options, $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month, or design your own, $7.50 a month, uh, $5 a month for six months. You decide. A dollar a week for public TV. Get the magazine. Know what's happening on public TV. Enjoy more quality programming than ever, but please act right now. We need to hear from five of you right away. Don? You make me breathless. <laughs> I, make me, I make me breathless. <laughs> if you aren't running to your My TV breath. sets right now. <laughs> We've had some good support from uh, Lakewood and Bedford and uh, Medina, and now we're down to four. We only need four more people who could call right now, if you would. Join channels 45 and 49 in a campaign to keep good television coming to you throughout the year. Uh, again, Patty Page and the uh, Jukebox Saturday Night will be coming to you in just a matter of two minutes. So if you are sitting there waiting for the program, please be patient. We'll bring you all of those wonderful hits from the 40s and the 50s. Uh, if you didn't know, the, uh, the program is, an, uh, is a, uh, a tribute to the 100th anniversary of the Jukebox, and it's going to bring you... Some of those great toe-tapping songs that you and I both remember from, uh, from those earlier days, uh, where we're still hearing them on an awful lot of Top 40 shows. And that program, and many more like it, are brought to you because of the great support of uh, contributors right now. Are you a member? Please join. Please join. It takes no more than a minute, and you'll get done and go watch your program and feel a lot better for it. But how about a dollar a week for public TV? Just a dollar a week will bill you, and it'll be a simple thing for you to do, and you'll love yourself in the process and like the shows, too. Lisa. That's right. You know, when I think about it, I know a lot of people are very concerned about what's happening with the economy right now, and there are lots of people who are, who are you know, feeding into your concerns, but... Uh, take it from a person who's not making a huge salary. $30 is a small investment for great television. Um, I don't think it's a huge amount to ask. $5 a month is not a huge amount to ask. When you think about what your priorities are and where you're putting your entertainment dollars, you know, if, you, if you're uh, home a lot or if you want to relax with the television set, you never have to worry about turning to public television and, and, and feeling disappointed and disgusted. There's always something wonderful happening on public TV. Thanks to our 25,000 current members. We are getting pretty close to that 10. We need, in fact, two more. Please, what about you? Can you get up and go to the telephone right now and help us make that goal? Every little mini goal helps us get closer to that 2,000 that we need, that we need right now uh, at, in order to continue to bring you these kinds of programs. We're going to get into Jukebox Saturday night, and I know you're going to enjoy it. It's a terrific program, and it's going to bring back a lot of memories. Hopefully, it will bring back some great memories of public TV, too, and uh, you'll remember why we're here right now and why you need to call. So please, get up and get to that telephone. If you were unable to make your pledge by phone, you can become a member of channels 45 and 49 by sending your contribution to channels 45 and 49, Kent, Ohio, 44240-5191.